Hello, my name is Ray Hughes and I'm an interviewer for the Veterans History Project conducted by the Library of Congress. And the interviews take place here in Cincinnati, Ohio at the Hamilton County Public Library at 9th and Walnut Streets, locally administered by Brian Powers, who's our cameraman today. And today's date is the 19th of July, 2017. And we have the honor and privilege today of, introduce, of interviewing uh, Don G. Kleingers, a Cincinnati relative and uh, resident, and it's a pleasure to meet you. Is it all right just to call you Don? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, Don, uh, what's your date of birth and when, where were you born? July 22nd, 1929, Cincinnati, Ohio. So that means you'll be 88 in three days, I think yes. it is. Yes, well, congratulations. You look great well, for, well, <laughs> for 88. <laughs> yes, yes, I didn't think I'd ever make yeah. it. But uh, uh, so you grew up in Cincinnati, uh, Don? Yes, yeah. all my life. Yeah. What schools did you go to? Grade school, for example? and St. Clement Grade School in St. Bernard and Roger Bacon High School in St. Bernard. I see. And uh, did you belong to a particular church in St. Bernard? St. Clement Church. St. Clement? Yes. And that's in St. Bernard also? Yes. Yeah. Everything St. Bernard. Yeah. Um, and what were your parents' names? Alfred Kleingers, Clara Kleingers. What was your mother's maiden name? Albers. Albers? Yes. Yeah. What did your dad do for a living, Don? He was a plumber. I see. Yes. And uh, did your mother work or did she? Uh, no, uh, just a homemaker. Homemaker? Yes. Yeah. And what about brothers and sisters? Well, I had two brothers and four sisters. So, so there was seven of us all together. I see. And uh, what, what year did you graduate from high school? 1947. 1947. And what did you do after high school? Well, I started working at a printing shop and uh, my father being a plumber, I eventually I just decided I'd follow him. He didn't want me to, he didn't think that was such a great job, but it's it worked out. Yeah. And so I just started uh, apprentice school, which was five years, but I, well, I only got in two years and then got drafted. In, you know. um, apprentice school, you mean apprenticeship while you were working or a school that you went to? Well, apprent uh, while we were working, we just went at night and Saturdays to a school that they run. That, it was a union shop. And uh -huh. Where was that conducted at? You well, they had a few different locations. Um, the last location was down, well, which was Central Vocational High School, which is now Cincinnati State. You know? Right. Yeah, that sounds like a wonderful program. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You say uh, you were drafted. Uh, w uh, when were you drafted? 1951, February of 1951. Yeah, I think we have written down on your on your form here that um, February 17th, 1951. Yes. Uh, you re you were living at home with your parents at that time. Yes. Um, and uh, where did you report to, Don? Or for well, your physical or whatever. Well, we went to a draft board in a over in Avondale on Reading Road, and for there they brought us downtown here to some building where they did physicals and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, we, we I passed, <laughs> and then we <laughs> and then we reported to that draft board, and they had a bus and had at this Fort Knox, Kentucky, that's where we for basic training. How quickly after you came downtown and did your physical, did they ship you down to Fort Knox? 
Well, maybe two months, I would, that's just an estimate, but about mm -hmm. that, that much. Okay, so sometime in uh, April of 1951, you would have reported to uh, the draft board. Draft yes. board. Um, were you worried about being drafted? Because as I remember, uh, the Korean War officially started June the 25th, 1950. 1950, yes. And uh, you were a prime draft age. I yes. Were you concerned about that at the time? Uh, Not really, because we really thought we'd be drafted for the World War II, so and everybody was being drafted, so it wasn't. Okay. I can't say I <laughs> didn't choose that, but yeah. you know, we accepted it, no problem. And you're single at this time? Yes. Yeah. So in April, do you go to Fort Knox for your basic training, or do you go to a different place? No, the uh, basic training at Fort Knox, they took us down there. Yeah, that was in sometime in, well, February. April or, uh, well, March or April of 51, you were, you were drafted in, on February 17th. Well, okay, that's the day we went in. That's, that, that's the day that I yeah. was reported mm -hmm. for uh, induction, so. Yeah. So uh, how many weeks basic training did you have at Fort Knox? I believe it was 12 weeks at the time. And what did that consist of, Don? Well, a lot of marching, a lot of road walk, you know, hikes and so forth. And then it was a armored basic training facility at Fort Knox. So then there was also training on with M4 tanks and all the school classes and things on gunnery and so forth. Now, when you go down to Fort Knox for basic training, do you know that you're not going to be in the infantry as a rifleman, or do you know you're being well, trained no. for? Uh, well, we for figured we were being trained for armored, but it after they left. They did a variety of things, but a lot of them went to Germany. They had a lot of armored, you know, at that time of mm -hmm. occupation there, so. And when you say armor, you mean uh, tank, yes. tanks or tank destroyers or, or what? Well, they just call it armored basic training. I mean, that was the MOS they gave us, armored MOS, so. Mm -hmm. Which, when we got to Korea, they were looking for that, you know, mm -hmm. because there was a, for some reason, a shortage over there. I mean, we had cooks and infantrymen and you name it, and they were, they didn't know why they were put in tanks either. They had never seen one before. So they oh. uh, said it was on the job training for, for well, and I'd say the guys who had armor training, there were, I don't even think half of us, they took us right away into, well, we, you went to a, uh, if you would then explain your training then. You're, you're being trained to, to be on a tank. Yes, yes. Yeah, Even okay. those that didn't get assigned to armored were trained for armored basic. It was a combination really. I mean, you took some infantry, which I guess was just natural army. You know, the marching and all the bivouacs and all that stuff. And uh, w w what type of training for a tank did you go through? Well, gunnery classes and then to drive. They try to give you a little bit of everything and not much of anything. I mean, uh, well, we had new M46 tanks and in that time they were all together different, you know. I mean, the equipment and everything is that's uh, always called the Patton tank? Patton M46. Mm -hmm. And the armament on that was what? A 90 millimeter? Was yes, it? 90 yeah. millimeter, 50 caliber on top, and two 30 caliber, one assistant driver and one in the coaxial with a 90 degree, with a 90 millimeters. Mm -hmm. 
Now, is the man who uh, drives that called a driver? Yes. Yeah. And what was your position? Well, you're well, I started out the first week, I guess, they a loader because they needed it. That a lot of times, you know, the five-man crew was only a four-man crew. So, but then as soon as the gunner, he was getting ready to re rotate out, why they? Because I had had training in that, they put me right into the gunner's position. So. And, and you say a loader, that you loaded the... 90 men. Yeah. How big a shell is that, would you say? Well, <laughs> I'm going to say it's about at least three foot long. The projectile is around four inches. And then the casing is, is uh, was about six inches. Six to eight, I'm not, you know. And what was the range on that, would you say? Well, I, I don't know a distance. I mean, that the uh, velocity in that is, I think the regular high explosive shells were like 27,000 feet per second. But then they had the uh, armor piercing shells and they were 2,900 2, feet per second or something. But it, it had a, uh, oh, now I can't think of the, it had, a, the projector was really, it come down to a needle point for, mm -hmm. for armor piercing. Um, tungsten uh, tip on it, uh, so. Okay, yeah. Which was kind of new, I think, and At extra that. hard. And so you had a, a total of 12 weeks training down there at Fort Knox? Well, in basic training, yes. And then I uh, signed up for leadership school. I kind of liked being at Fort Knox. So, uh, and that's where it was held, leadership school? Yes. At Fort Knox? Uh, yes. And then I, so we had another, I think that was like six weeks or something, a leadership school. And then after that, um, kind of got put on cadre for basic training companies, but that didn't last long. In about a week or two, all of a sudden, they got called out in Far East Command, so. <laughs> uh, tell us about the leadership school. Um, well, the, uh, uh, I'm trying to, that's long, 60 some years ago. But no, they just went into stuff like being a leader of your men and taking care of men and so how to, forth. How to be an NCO. Yeah. yeah. Which it come in handy as a tank commander because that was, you were, well, I shouldn't say babysitting four other guys, but that's, you know. That was your job. This your job was to take care of them. Take and care to of make them. Make sure right. they were trained and did their job properly. Yes. Yeah. Um, so you went through that for an additional six weeks. What rank are you at this time? Well, we got private first class when we got out of leadership school. Okay. <clears throat> and then I was, um, when I went to Gunner, which was about a month or so after I got over there, you know, made a corporal. And then a couple of months, they would need tank commanders, so I got that. And then there was sergeant, and that's um, where I... So after your uh, initial 12 weeks training and then leadership school for six weeks, uh, where did you go from there? Well, that's from there we left and went to Korea. When that was the Far East Command, you Far said? Far East Command, yes. And where did, it, so you, did you get to come home on leave or anything? Well, yes, yeah, we, well, with the basic and the leadership and that, we had been there a few months, so we, I think we had three years of before, and then we had a report, well, we had a meet, a troop train in Chicago. How long of a leave did you have? 
I think it was like three weeks. We three had. weeks? Yes. Yeah. And, and uh, how did you get home in those days? It's a Greyhound bus. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, other than Fort Knox, I there was some guys who had cars, but mm -hmm. uh, I didn't have no car or nothing. And being from down there, you know, that was five and a half hour drive. Right. So we used to come home quite a bit from. Did you? you know, yeah. From weekends. So. Mm -hmm. But all the other stuff. I, so you're uh, you're going to be. Uh, you're going to be shipped out to the Far East Command. Where did you go to be shipped overseas to what city? Well, we met the troop train in Chicago and it took us out to San Francisco. And then uh, that's where we got on the General MiGs and shipped out. For MiGs, M-E-I-G-S, General yes. MiGs. And that was a troop carrier? Troop ship. carrier, yes. Yeah. yeah, there was about 5,000. Air Force and Army and so, and not, not very, it wasn't a cruise ship, <laughs> so. You, uh, what were the sleeping facilities like on board the MiG? Well, I think it was four high and I was one, we were way down in the bottom of the ship where it was, <laughs> so, that's, uh, you had to take turns to get out of bed and get in the bed to stand up and everything. So, yeah, everything was just yeah. like on a shelf. That's, uh -huh. They called that living. <laughs> so, um, and you had a lot of Air Force guys on board there too. At yes, that time. We were, they were kind of separated from the Air did, Force. From did you stop anywhere on the way? Uh, no. Did they, and you knew you were going to Korea? Yes. Well, 15 days to get to Yokohama, Japan. That's where we landed, Yokohama. And that was like two or three days before Christmas. So this is uh, December there. of 1951. One, yes. Yeah. So we were there, I think about a week, th three days before Christmas and then a Christmas and then back on a train and went to Sasebo, Japan. And that's where we shipped across to Pusan. We were on a Japanese, they called it a cruise ship, I don't know. The officers had cabins. We went on the ballroom floor down in the basement, slept behind the bar, so that was, <laughs> uh, well, we did that just so out they just, well, everybody was just crammed in line. It was just an overnight trip, though. Um, and you landed at Pusan? Yes. It's on the southern part of, um, of Korea. Korea? Yes. Uh, tell us about uh, when you landed there and got off board, off board of the ship, how you felt when you had to touch the ground there in Korea? Well how you felt was, what are we doing here? <laughs> and, uh, well, on the way over, they do have, you know, showed some movies, why Korea, you know, explained all the communists, you know, and they had other movies, you know, kind of like training films, you know, to, you know, don't lose your weapon because it'll be used against you and just stuff and like that. And don't think you're too so important. They said, uh, man, they can always get, you're, you're not as important as tent pegs because we, we, we don't have enough of them. <laughs> so so maybe, that was a, that give was, you a real good wholesome feeling. We, we yeah, yeah, you look around. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I always remember that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine, yeah. So, have you made any friends by this time, buddies or not? Well, this one fellow that I took basic with, and he went to leadership school, and well, he lived over in Price Hill, but 
Well, he had a car too, that so I made a friend <laughs> with him. Well, when we were at Fort Knox. What was his name, do you recall? Don Miller was his name. Don Miller? Yes. Yeah. But uh, other, other than that, it, up until then, well, you didn't know, really know anybody. So, so, so um, after getting all the educational and propaganda movies, you landed Pusan. Yes, and saw and, the uh, real the real deal then, so. Yeah. What, what, what were your thoughts about the Korean War, and not a, a, at that time? I'm thinking about politically speaking, or? Well, like I say, that movie, it did give you the, you know, some idea up until that, like they always said, well, where's Korea, you know, what is it, or, you know, nobody even, knew where it was and right but uh, no they just showed these movies and how the communists were just slowly you know taking over kept moving until somebody stopped them and that gave you some idea of what you were doing there but were you aware of uh, the initial uh, setbacks that the army had in Korea at that time? At that time, not really. I mean, all basic training and that, they, they didn't emphasize, you know. I mean, at that time, that was more hand-to-hand -hand stuff than, than, you know, even the Second World War, I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, but... Um, so you, no. you, uh, you land there at Pusan. If you would, take us through the next couple of days or weeks or? Well, the first thing you did is you came off the, the ship. They had open back trucks, trucks like cattle trucks, you know. And you marched off the ship and up, <laughs> right up onto these, no seats, no nothing, just walk, keep walking until you couldn't walk no more and they packed you. They said, this isn't a long trip, so, so, <laughs> so, uh, and from there they took us to a train, you know, railroad station and put us on a train heading up towards Seoul at that time. So, and the trains, that was What time of year is this? January the 2nd. January the 2nd, yeah. 1951. No, 1952, yeah. no, yeah. yes. Cold. Definitely cold never knew before <laughs> never seen anything. are you adequately dressed as far as uh, winter clothing well we weren't until we went up to our you know when we got assigned to the 73rd tank battalion and then we got all the parkas and uh, mittens and um, then then we had regular army what about, equipment what about boots well, I know there was a lot of complaints about them, but those rubber Mickey Mouse boots, they kept you warm, but their problem was that your feet sweat, and then when you stopped walking, why well, they'd freeze, that was a big thing. But I never experienced that. Well, I mean, I got cold, but never actually froze, mm -hmm. other than maybe my hands, some on your way up to uh, Seoul from Pusan, are, are you armed? Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, we had a carrier. Well, they gave us carbines. I don't know. Actually, those were, well, you either got an M1 or a carbine, or it didn't really mean that you were going to the infantry or nothing. I mean, right. they just gave you something to carry up there. Right. Well, yeah, they'd have a guard. You had to stay on guard duty on that train, you know, mm -hmm. thing. So, but you'd rather be standing than sitting those Korean tra trains there. I mean, in those days, <laughs> all just a little wooden back. Of a, the back was about this high. <laughs> Guys were laying up in the baggage racks and everything else, trying to sleep. <laughs> Fun times. Oh, I can only imagine. No. Um, mm. So you you arrive in um, 
in Seoul, and this is January of 1952. Yes. Uh, and you get off of the train and take us from there, if you would, please. Okay. They they had a uh, oh. I'm trying to think of what they called it. A uh, I've, hold it a minute. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, okay, it was a replacement depot, they called it. A repo? A yes. Repo. <laughs> and, and then, well, there was, we went into it, it was a downtown building, and most of the buildings were half down, and this had a, the Army had a, some offices on the first floor, they says, well, you can just you know, go upstairs, and, and uh, that'll be your room, you know, well. So as we went up, there was no windows, there's nothing, <laughs> you know. All we had was sleeping bags, so threw it on the floor upstairs, and that was our sleeping. We were only there a day, or a night, something like that. And then they called you out and called your name, jump on this truck and that, and they were scattering them out, so. Had no idea where we were even going. Just or did you have an idea who you were going to be assigned with or to? No, no, not till they just, as they went up the road, they called a name and there it is, go there. And went up there and I saw there was a tank sitting there and they called my name and <laughs> jump off and just go over and see what they got. And so. And uh, do you remember, remember the location of where you were dropped off? Well, it, it was about 20 miles north of Seoul, and the only name I saw later in that was there was a railroad station in Moonsani in that area, which is kind of the eastern side, or no, the western side of Korea. M Musan? Moonsani. Uh -huh. I think that's where the, uh, the 187th Airborne made their only jump or something. Mm -hmm. But we were back. This was the, uh, oh, oh, I guess they call the headquarters of the 73rd of B Company now. Just it, they were, you know, different so, areas. B Company 73rd Tank Battalion. Yes. And what's your, what is your position or, or job when you're assigned there? Well, I mean, I... Were well, you a, a, like a gunner or, or...? Well, okay, no. no they had no, I didn't have no assignment then. And they were up with the 1st Rock Division. And this, this was their kind of base camp. That, ah. And uh, they said to just wait or put you in a tent there. They had a squad tent like and go in and just hang around and they said that well they said they would didn't want to send us up because they were gonna be coming back. They alternated with C Company then would replace B Company up up on the line and they'd be in the reserve. Well so in a couple of days they come rolling down and well they were they were happy to be back because uh, when you went up there that meant sea rations only for 30 days <laughs> no showers no nothing you know while you're on the line yeah and, and you were kind of lost uh, there was no other Americans. It was strictly a first rock division. What does rock mean? Oh, Republic of Korea. That's that's all. And are they Korean troops? Yes, yes. Yeah, they Okay. Um, you uh, did did have you been assigned to a tank while you're there at the uh, what reserve? At, at the base camp. At there. the base camp. Well, they, okay, they come rolling in, and they, you know, the guy that the platoon sergeant says, 
uh, he said, we'll just come back. He said, just, we're going to get something to eat and get some sleep. <laughs> he said, we're going to, well, I'll give you an assignment tomorrow, you know. Well, they, they got something to eat. And uh, the next thing they come out, C Company didn't have enough tanks to replace them up on the line. He said, you just jump in that tank there. And he said, get in the assistant driver's seat. And those guys were all crab and they had to go back, head back up on the line. So they weren't too happy. They had just spent a month on them, sea rations and stuff. And this is B Company? Yes. Um, well, the second platoon. Of B Company? Of B Company, oh. yes. And how many tanks are in that second pl platoon? Five. Five? Yes. Uh, so you were assigned as an assistant driver? Well, I, he said just go there. They didn't, uh, and when we get up there, <laughs> we'll, uh, you know, work something out. They, I, I was called a loader when we got up there. He just okay. said ride up there. Well, what rank are you at that point? PFC. PFC? Yes. And, okay, so you're riding up to the front line, right? Yes. And where are, the, where are the front lines at this time? Well, they were north of that um, Moon Sani, and somewhere the Imjin River was up in that area. And I, you know, like I say, I'm. There's no street sign or nothing up there. It's just uh, things that you pick up. But is this, when you get up there, is that mountainous terrain or? Yes, yes. Uh, I don't know if I should get into this story or not. I mean, uh, yeah, go ahead. Gotta, well, the first, we pulled up there and, well, first of all, on the way up, it's snowing like crazy again, which you get a lot of over there. Oh. <laughs> and the driver leans over and he says, is your hatch lock locked, you know? I said, well, I don't know, I'll just I'll try to latch it. And he said, well, he says, you always want to keep that latched. He says, they got a habit of jumping on a tank and they'll lift up that, that, that and drop grenade now to, you know it scared me to death I mean this is my first day and uh, I reached up and well it was all iced around there I couldn't pull it down you know <laughs> I couldn't get it down I scratching and that and so finally I just grabbed a hold of it and I kind of hung on it I said if that Chinese guy can lift you know, me, I was about 190 pounds in that latch, which is, I says, he deserves to get that. So anyway, it was nothing happened on the way anyway, but that's just my first day, you remember. Sure. And then when we got up there, they, they put the tank down, which I, I don't know to this day why they went way down this finger of the hill and set the tank down there and then went back up the hill into the woods and put up this little five-man tent, and, you know, because they figured we were going to be there a while. That's the only time we put up a tent. Well, and somebody has to be with that tank up, you know, all the time, guard. And um, so naturally, me being the new guy, they about 2 o'clock, in the, 1 or 2 in the morning, they sent me down there. You know, so I go down and the guy, he just told me, you got to check in with base camp, tell them every hour or so, and start the tank up to keep the batteries up in the tank. And so I'm sitting up there and looking down the hill and I see all these strings of machine gun bullets going back and forth, you know, right down the hill. So. Now this is my first night, I didn't know anything, you know. So I just kind of laid, set grenades up there and we hit a, a submachine gun and a carbine in the tank. And you were inside the tank? Well, I'm sitting up on top outside, but oh. I got all this stuff stacked around me. <laughs> Those guys didn't say nothing. I mean, they just sent me down there to, 
So after my time was up, I start back up the hill and I said, well, I don't know how to get, where are they? They're somewhere up there in those woods. And I kept going, there was a kind of clearing and then the woods. And then I saw a path and I thought, well, I, I think that may be the one I come down. Well, I start, we got uh, two steps up there and a Korean soldier jumped out with a bayonet and he had it pushed into my throat there <laughs> and his finger on the trigger. And well, I had my uh, uh, parka and it all pulled up. I mean, it was yeah. way below zero somewhere, I don't know. And, but he didn't say nothing. He just stood there like that, you know. But he's holding that bayonet and his finger on the trigger. I said, that 45 I had, I didn't think that would be much good, you know, in that situation. Right. So he just kept standing there, and I, I'm hoping he's a South Korean. I, I don't know who he is, you know. And, um, but he didn't say nothing, and I was afraid to move, and I didn't want to say nothing. I can't speak Korean or nothing. Right. You know? Finally, he says, you GI. Well, yeah, 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 GI. I said, gee, that was the best thing I ever heard. Well, I didn't know, you right. know, you can't tell a North Korean from a South Korean. They all look alike. You know? Right. But, uh, and all this happened in the first day. Those guys thought it was funny. I said, that wasn't funny when that guy jumped, put that bayonet, and hit his finger on the trigger. And I'm, oh. I'm looking right down there. And I didn't know what to do. But anyway, I got through that. But um, so from there on, you just went on. Uh, <laughs> those those winters were so horrific. How did did you ever get warm while you're up there in that tent that night? Not really. You just <laughs> just kept all that clothes on. I mean, your sleeping bag and that. The only thing it took off of your boots, and other than that, you had a parka and all that stuff. And uh, when you took your boots off. Would you, how'd you keep your feet warm? Well, in the sleeping bag. Uh, turn the boots up so they don't get full of snow. <laughs> they, mm -hmm. that's, uh, you learn little tricks. Okay. Just pile the snow up and... Did you ever have any problem with uh, frostbite or anything over there? Not... Made my hands a couple of times, but that, that was trying to do something with a... You know, working on the tank that... So... Well, let's go into your second day. Well, I say <laughs> it was much better. I well, I, I got to, you see, I didn't even know who these guys were. I just met them two hours before that. And, you know, that, that was all them getting sent right back up there. Was, but no, then we just stayed up on that hill. That's what we did with the, and, uh, if, well, nothing really happened at, at this point. That, I mean, they were down there in the, just patrols in the valley that were shooting all back and forth, but they didn't try to advance up the hill, so we just let them alone. Well, we let them alone. You don't do nothing unless somebody directs you, you know. Mm -hmm. But they didn't call for no fire nowhere, so. So you spent 30 days up on the line then? Yes. Have you made any friends while you're uh, on? The, uh, oh, oh, yes. Well, you get very close. You've got four other men with you yes. inside that yeah. tank. Right. And in that little tent, you're sleeping just <laughs> practically on top of each other, too. I mean, it was just a little round. And do you recall any of the friends that you made while you were there in that first 30 days that you had to spend there? Well, uh, well, the sergeant Kitchens, a platoon sergeant, well, because I got put on his tank, you know. Kitchens? Yes, but mm -hmm. he's dead long, never. 
later on, and I got to know some of these other tank, you know, not too long, but just, uh, yeah, I can recall some names, I mean, but. Uh, Have you bonded with anybody at this point in that first 30 days? Well, I think we were all bonded, uh, just the fact that, and you know, we were, they were integrating at that time, and so, no, I got, well, pretty close to some of them, you, you know. Uh, by integrating, what do you mean? Well, they were, the, they were putting black and white. African American, yeah. and slight guys. Yeah, the driver on this tank that I was assigned to at first was a black from Dayton, Ohio. I see. You don't recall his name by any chance, do you? Mm -hmm. Again, I should, but I don't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen him since the war? No. no. Did, did, did they have any problem with the, in your outfit with this integration with the blacks and whites? No, no. I mean, not, not between us. I mean, uh, some of them had some stories, I mean, uh, that we know as far as you don't, <laughs> you're yeah. kind of dependent on each other. And, yeah. and, and no, I, this little black, that guy that was a driver, I, well, I was always teamed up with him a lot of times on guard duty. And no, I, no, he, um, one night he got so scared, I think he almost jumped on my lap. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, wow. Did, were you called on to fire your, uh, the weapons that you had on your tank uh, while you were there in that first 30 days? No. Well, in that 30 days, I would have been a loader. I, uh, mm -hmm. But we, we had no, at that, up to that point, no firing mission, nothing. So after your um, after your first thirty days, are you called back? Well, yes, and we went back to the base camp, and from there we would just go out from there, block roads or here and there. You know, they want backup. You know, for infantry mm -hmm. after they try to take a hill or something and. We were there in case they got counterattacked and stuff. But the tanks, you know, you're not very mobile in the, with over there with no roads or, right. well, they're roads, but they're... A lot of, it's mostly mountains, isn't it? Yeah, mountains and, and rice paddies. And neither one, you know, has rice paddies. You just, they just sink down and you had to watch them. <laughs> Of course, when they were frozen, you could go over some of them, but, uh, mm -hmm. but that was... Uh, um, and you're eating uh, mostly uh, American food, American chow and K rations, I guess? Well, C rations. C rations. Is what we had, yes. Yeah. You haven't had any liberty there uh, in Korea at all? No, no, we don't. When we were there, there was not, there was no known liberty that I know of. We we were. You were telling me about a friend of yours that in private conversation from Louisiana or something. Um, how yes. did, what was his name? How did you team up with him? Well, his name was Charles Chalette. He was from. Uh, no, he he came in shortly after I did, and he kind of followed the same routine I did, and and no, then he got to be a tank commander, and and you kind of stuck together there. You were well, we were sergeants, and then uh, you know you kind of stayed a little separate. I mean, not <laughs> not when it comes to friendships or hanging around together, you know. Well, you started out as an assistant driver. Uh, when did you become a tank commander and explain that, how, you, how that happened? Well, 
I was never really a sign assistant driver. I, I, they told me to take that seat on the way up the first time. But then they said I would be the loader. Well, because I had tanks in, you know, training, you know, they said you know, And leadership got, school also. Yes, and, but they said you know how to handle them and stay out of the way of those hot casings coming back and don't step on them or red hot, you know, and all that. So, uh, but then from there, then I took over the gunners uh, because again, because I had the tra some training, a lot of them had never, you know, hit it. And uh, then I was a gunner for a few months and then when a tank commander opened up on a tank, well, I mean, the guy got roots sent back home, well, rotated out. Then I was assigned that tank and for and the rest of my time. And were you promoted right away or what? Yes, yeah, as soon as you got the, they moved in armor, they moved us up pretty quick. I mean, I was only there about 11 months and I went from PFC to sergeant. And now, were, are, did, were you in the same tank the whole time, or did you get different tanks? Yes, no, same tank. The same. And so basically you had the same crew most of the time? Well, other than rot rotating rotation. some out, yes. Uh, uh, the gunner was replaced. Uh, the, the guy then, when I rotated, he took over as tank commander. but. Uh, I think I had two drivers. One of them was a Polish kid that <laughs> he fought with the Polish <laughs> against the Germans <laughs> when he was 15 or 16. Because <laughs> mm. he said they weren't too well armed. He said they gave you a bottle of gasoline and you go try to get a German and get to get his weapon. That, that's how they armed. He had been wounded, I don't know, but he showed us machine gun bullets in his leg and stuff. He was kind of a, a wild, <laughs> loose guy. <laughs> but um, now if he was a driver then, sort of, till I went home. Have you uh, stayed in touch with any of the guys that you were on your, in your Oh yes, I, when I, out, Oh, I guess it's 15 years ago, there was a guy started a 73rd Tank Battalion reunion, a fellow in New York, and I just happened, a friend of mine told me he saw it in a, uh, in, in, you know, the, the Greybeard magazine, you know, and uh, so I called well, this was, the wife had died and I was looking for things to do anyway and they were getting, they were having it out in Missouri and in uh, Independence, Missouri. Mm -hmm. So I, I signed up and went out there and I looked over the roster that was going to be there and I saw this guy's name, Shannon Corm, and I said, could that be the same Shannon Corman? He was he was a tank commander on 23, which I followed throughout. <laughs> but um, he came in, and sure enough, it was a guy that you know. And later that we got that Shillette to come, but he only got the one, and then he went home that winter, and he died. I don't know. So so at one time there was three of ours that we were right together, you know, but, um, and well, a lot of these guys were, you know, belonged to, this. but a tank, you know, where you're not too much together unless you know, you know the platoon you're in and, mm -hmm. I mean, there's no, I don't know what you call it, no, other than that, that's, that's the way it was. I, I you never really mixed. On these, um, 
on these different times, did you continue doing like 30 days on a line, then back for a week or so, and then 30 days more, or did you? Well, that was the, the routine when we were with I Corps and and with the fir, uh, with the first Rock Division. Then, you know, when it got to be summertime, all of a sudden they were going to pull the first Rock Division out and the first Marine, American First Marine Division is going to take over that sector that they had. So at that point they, they said they were going to move us over around on the east coast of Korea. They had something going, I don't know. So we went back and went back to Incheon and they loaded us on LSTs and we're we're think we're living. We <laughs> we had regular food <laughs> and a place to sleep, and we thought we were gonna. Have, well, they said it was gonna take four or five days. Well, we got out one night, and all of a sudden they're heading back into Incheon again. There's something going. <laughs> so, so the old story, you know, that while well, they broke through everybody's problem, but. That wasn't true anyway. They ch changed it. They were moving us. Then we went up around the Chorwon Valley with the 7th American Infantry Division. So you got off the LST and went yes. back on inland? Well, back on, well, it, we went there on f railroad flat cars and then uh, they, we loaded back on these trains, flat cars, and they took us somewhere in the south of Chorwon. Well, Chorwon is actually in North Korea, so they, um, they unloaded and then we were assigned, well, we would move between the 9th Rock Division was with the 7th Infantry at, around that area, that Iron Triangle thing they're always talking about, you know. That's north of the 38th parallel. Yes, you know. Not too far, but you are actually north. So we were with, well, the rest of my time there, we then they switched, we wore a 7th Infantry patch, and, and that was, but we did move around with them and their different regiments, you know. Mm -hmm. Each infantry regiment, they have their own tanks, but just like a, a company or something. So we're, we were always back up or fill in or whatever, so. But. Did you ha have any of the guys in your outfit that were wounded and killed there? No, not while I was there. Mm -hmm. But they, right before we were there, well and after, after I left, I, I was, then that's when they had that big uh, in early 1953, well, this was late 52 when it all started, that Iron Triangle. Mm -hmm. uh, then our, I knew the platoon leader, I don't know, he lost a leg or something. Uh, but he, uh, they, they took some, but at that point I had gone home, so. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, <laughs> oh, I just wasn't was in the right spot at the right time. I, mm -hmm. I mean, as far as I know, we had some close shells and well. Mortars. I was going to ask you: Did you hear a lot about uh, some of the Koreans in caves and things like that? Did did you ever have to fire on any of them? Well, yeah, that's that's what they would call us up there to do if they were, you know, if they had caves and things and, and artillery they couldn't, where we could fire into them. You know, mm -hmm. direct fire right. tank is a better. But uh, yes, we did, that was one of the things, did more of that, that and try to hit forward observer post, you know, when they, when they were getting mortar fire, they said, there's somebody up there directing that fire. So mm -hmm. we would try to go along the ridge of the hill, just nothing else scare them back. And 
Yeah. And we always said sometimes that you never saw it hit, so it went over the hill, and they, that probably did more damage than what we were trying to do. So, but um, when you fired that, that that ninety millimeter, you're inside the tank. Is it is the the turret down? Is it closed? No, because I was just concerned about well, the concussion. Well, because yeah, yeah. Uh, what? Well, it isn't as as. What do you call it? Frightful, frightening, or, or yeah, no, not being in it. Now, see, as a tank commander, though, you you're directing fire, but you're just with the my binoculars got the same thing as the gunners got markings in there, you know, mm -hmm. and range and and. Uh, I I estimate how far out that target is. Now, you right. know, you're just, uh, <laughs> we're in the old age, you were estimating all these ranges and things. And then, you know, he'll fire, but when he fires, I gotta duck down and get, because that back blast, you know, that, that'll knock, tear you up. So I duck and then jump up and try to see where that where his shell hit, and then give him any adjustments when I see him. But uh, that's. <laughs> well, I thought there might be some effect inside the tank also when it. Well, there there isn't. Everybody thinks that, and I well, you naturally think that all that recoil and that, but it's much quieter right inside and don't be outside around it then that's when they and that back blast off at 90 is yeah. you know the, the only the only thing you have inside and uh, that's part of your initiation as a loader they cl you clean the barrels with gasoline and oil you know and, and and get the barrel clean. Mm -hmm. Well, the first shell that goes out, that's, that stuff burns, and, the, and there's flame, but then and the vacuum, you know, that that shell pulled out, those flames come back out of that, that thing, and you think you're in hell. <laughs> and then they sit and laugh. I mean, they don't tell the loader that that's what happened. <laughs> But only the first shell, once that oil is burnt out of there, then. But it's it's that vacuum that it draws, that shell going out, and the, then, then it pulls that flame back through. <laughs> Did you have any close encounters with North Koreans firing at your tank? Well, Either with rifle fire or, or artillery oh, or mortars or well mortars yes uh, we and uh, well we had a lot of that because that's mostly you know when when they when they start artillery then they start calling air strikes and things on them and uh, but no uh, we've. One day, one of those whistled by us. I don't know how far close it was, but <laughs> you heard it whistle. Yes, yes, and that's too that's, close. Yeah. Well, this was very close. We were on just up on a hill, and but rifle fire. I that couple times. I uh, I say you don't want to be outside, but we thought we were losing a tank or a track. I mean, the driver said something was wrong, so I said, "Well, I'll just let me take a look at it." Well, that wasn't the thing to be doing because as soon as I walked around the front of that tank, I heard these—I guess it was a rifle—zing right by me, and he must have thought he knocked me down. I went so fast and jumped back in that tank. <laughs> But I, we waited a while, and then I went out, and I, the track was just starting to come off, and and the rest of the tanks were leaving. We were backing up some I thought, 32nd Regiment of the 7th Infantry, 
and I know that wasn't a place to be out there by ourselves. Do the you ever recall being with the 17th Regiment? Well, 30, mostly with the 30, 32nd and what, 31st and 32nd Regiments. I, the 17th, I think that they had that, but I don't, I don't recall us ever being mostly the 32nd and 31st. 31st yeah. And then they were kind of with the 9th Rock Division. We went out with them. So, so it, I, I'd see that Chor Wan Valley. And, Chor Wan? Yeah. Now, is that a different uh, Corps? I, you said I Corps was when you... When we first got there, yeah. and that was with the 9th Rock. Is there such a, uh, was there such a thing in Korea's second corps or area or what? While well, you're with the seventh division, yes, is that yeah. designated a particular area? Well, I don't think so. They, you okay. know, most of them got moved all over. I mean, okay. the seventy third tank had earlier in the in the war when they were way up on the Yalu River. Mm -hmm. The 73rd tanks were with, but I wasn't there at that present yeah. time. How far north did you go with the 72nd Battalion, Tank Battalion? Well, we were up, like up north of Chor Wan, but not too far. We were out in the Chor Wan Valley, which is a big expanse, but there was like a horseshoe mountains around it, but that was all Chinese there. I, you know, that had that, so, but we, we went out with the Ninth Rock, they were trying to take out one of the hills for some reason or other, I don't know, the Chinese had everything else, I don't know why they wanted that one hill, but that's, uh, but, <clears throat> but then we found out later that was part of us sending us out there was trying to Draw, draw them into counterattack, and then that's. I guess they play games. We never. Mm -hmm. Later they explained that, because <clears throat> they said, you know, we should fire fire all our uh, ammunition, and then they said get on the radio and report you're running low, <laughs> and. Uh, they said, because it's Chinese, they're, they're on your radio things. And he says, they may try to come out after us. He says, yeah, what about us? <laughs> but he says, well, the night before we came through Cherwan, they said, didn't you see all those tanks were parked down the roads? I said, well, I see they had a whole bunch of tanks ready to come out if they did. But uh, when you find out you're a decoy, <laughs> that ain't such a good idea. But, so um, you, you're fighting against both the uh, North Korean soldiers and the Chinese? Yes. And, well, at that time, I think there was more Chinese than there was North Korean soldiers. Yeah, one time this, <coughs> the, uh, our, our, platoon leader who was a lieutenant had come out of West Point. I don't know why, he <clears throat> he took us to a kind of a high level meeting and then they we went in this place and they had all these infantry outfits there and they were just showing all the Chinese, you know, divisions and North Korean divisions and on the op opposite us, they said. <laughs> we thought, man, we're really outnumbered here, man. <laughs> There's thousands and thousands of them. And, but uh, I don't know why we went to that meeting. He just, <clears throat> well, he was one that liked to do things the right way, I guess. Mm -hmm. Do you recall where that meeting was? No, but it, it was a I think a 7th Infantry Division meeting. He was, this lieutenant was from West Point, and he, he did a lot of things we didn't agree with, but uh, no, he was a Did good you guy. remember his name? Do you remember his name? Oh, yes. <laughs> lieutenant Buckstead. 
his Buckstead. Yeah, his father was a general in the Second World War, and he come out of West Point. No, he was a good guy, but he did things like, you know, they called us or going up a mission the first, with some, I think, out, could have been the 77th infantry. Anyway, he, the day before, he calls the five tank commanders and get in the Jeep, going up the road. He said, I want to show you so tomorrow we don't have to be picking out the targets. I'll show them to you tonight or this afternoon. And we go going up the road and all of a sudden there's mortars start hitting in front of us and back of us. <laughs> he said, hey, he said, oh, he said, there's some bunkers up here. He said, let's get off this road. I said, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> But that he he always seemed to get get us in the and he's the one that I know he got hit up there just all one after I was there. But I thought well he's probably out there trying to do something he shouldn't have been doing. I don't know. But he was nice. <laughs> 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 well, like the time he wanted me sticking my head up out of there and directing fire when they were getting all that mortar fire. I said, sir, I'm going home in a couple of weeks. I said, I'll just, <laughs> okay. He said, just tell that gunner then to start hitting the top of that hill. So there's somebody up there directing this fire. So I don't <laughs> he wanted you to stand up out of the turret, huh? Well, he said, yeah. He says, we're up out of here. He says, get up there. I said, well, but a couple of mortars had hit. Well, in fact, the guy next to me radioed over. He said, you, everything okay? I said, yeah. He said, why? He said, a lot of smoke and stuff coming up out of the, underneath that tank. I said, well, it hit, it hit close. I didn't, so. And you're going home in two weeks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, I don't know. No use of me trying to be a hero and directing that. So. But uh, no, he was just those experiences. Yeah. I know. Yeah. yeah. Um, did you lose any any men in your platoon? No. While you were there. No. no we were. Well, well. See, at that stage, and like I say, tanks. You just you couldn't get, you know, you couldn't get up on those hills where all the fighting yeah. was going. You're always away from, you know, the, <clears throat> and they didn't have at that point, the, the, with the air power and that, they, their tanks were long gone, you know. So. Mm -hmm. Did you have a lot of, of uh, airplanes flying overhead at that time while you were there? Well, we'd and, see and them, With their yes. strikes? Oh yes, yeah. They be they were always dropping napalm and stuff ahead. That was put on a on a show for us, you know. They <laughs> yeah. But, um, How close to those napalm drops were you? Would you say? Well, we we were. Oh, we were probably a half mile from from mm -hmm. them, but. When we were there with a chore one with a, they were all the Ninth Rock Division. They were bringing guys back. They were all burned. They says those napalm. They were dropping them too close to the, you know, to our guys. Huh? Yes, yeah. You know. So that's how do you spell that name of that town that you mentioned there? Chorwan. C H O R W O N. Chorwan. Yes. Okay. And that's north of the 38th parallel. Yes. Yeah. 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 They call it the Iron Triangle. It's it's Kaesong and I don't know. They got three cities. That okay. They, but. Uh, Did you uh, did you ever? We always hear about so many Chinese uh, being over there, like hundred thousand or three hundred thousand. Yeah. 
did you ever encounter any of them visually in those large in large numbers? Oh, well, not not visually in large numbers, but no, we used to sit in the evening <laughs> and watch and you'd see them start coming down the hill, you know, into the valleys. Well, and these American, they were heading out down into the valley too. And no, those infantry guys, they'd stop by the tank, they say, hey, don't be firing into that valley for anything. He said, we're gonna be down there. So, you know, we'd have, um, but we, we would watch, I don't, but you don't fire stuff like that. I mean, with, but we, you could see the path and that coming down the hills, and as soon as it started getting dark, you could, we'd watch them parading down through there. But, you know. So your time is, uh, is there anything else you want to share about with us right now about your time there on the line? Well, any other stories about your buddies or close events or close calls or well, this is your chance to quote history <laughs> well, <laughs> for, our, for our friends in the future. Well, well, I think I kind of covered, I mean, the highlights and, and yeah. it's stuff we... I, on your cap, or hat, yes. as some people call them, um, I see uh, three, three, three medals represented yeah. and one uh, star. Um, yeah. Could you tell me what those are? Yeah. Well, well this, this is the... Uh, the blue with the white stripe? Yeah, that's the Far East Commander or the... That's... Uh, mm -hmm. No, <laughs> yeah, but, okay, this, this one is, is the Far East Command. Oh, okay. This, this is the UN medal, uh -huh. and that's the Good Conduct Medal. And what so, is that bronze star there? Well, battle stars, they call them for the different... bronze star? Yes. Or not, or, mm -hmm. they, they say we could, we could have a couple more of them, but I, that's, that's all they gave me when we want to come out, so I just... What, uh, you mentioned a key word there, United Nations uh, ribbon. Uh, did you serve over there or, uh, no, or with any other United Nations troops? Oh yeah, well, yes. We, uh, with, with that rock division, then they had, I think, Greeks. Oh, and they had a couple other places. Australians by any chance? Or? No, there, I, but we did run across Turks and um, oh, yeah. Ethiopian. In fact, Ethiopian, one time, they were, they had volunteered to take some hill, but they came back and they, uh, we showed them, they were gonna ride the tanks across this open ground if we could get across it and then get close enough and they would jump off and take off. But to get, they couldn't get across this open ground. So they came back and, you know, on a tank, you don't want to be, they always want to stand on the <laughs> mufflers and things. Those things get red hot. They don't want to stand there long, you know, melt your shoes off. Right. Well, the rocks, they, they come back too one time. They with some maneuvers that we were going to take them. None of these things ever happened, but... Uh, and the Greeks and Turks, any... Uh, Ethiopians, we... And who... Well, there, were, there was like Puerto Ricans and too, but they were all integrated, Connie, and we did see the British one time. They were all dressed up <laughs> when they were over there. But, uh, and I, we have some French tr troops, but 
So you saw quite a bit of different kinds well, of Well, because stories. they moved us, you know. Mm -hmm. See, that's the thing. We didn't have a base, you know. You found yourself being attached to different groups all yes, the yeah. whole time you were there. Huh? Yes. Actually, I, we were only attached that we knew was the, the first rock division and with I Corps, and then when we went and the Seventh Infantry and the Ninth Rock divisions, we but in between there you, we'd get chipped, you know, but just block roads or whatever, just kind of. But then uh, you were kind of an orphan, <laughs> orphan outfit. I mean, uh -huh. when we would go up. First, I don't know why the cooks and things didn't, wouldn't come, you know, anywhere. The only time we had regular hot food and meals is if you were back at the base camp. Uh, no, we'd see rations, I mean. For, what is a sea ration? Well, that's everything in can, cans, just a couple cans, canned fruit. No. Uh, beans and wieners and so just but we'd stick them in the exhaust pipe and get them hot and then that, that was our but you get so tired of eating those same things you know day after day you were there for one thanksgiving weren't you no no i was i didn't no holiday actually i say we were in japan for Christmas and New Year's, and then by Thanksgiving, I was on my way home, so. Okay. See, well, they had that point system, and you got four points for being in combat zones, but we always got four points, because we were up and back. And uh, four points for each time you're in a combat zone? Well, in, in, in any one month. In any one month? Yes. So you accumulated quite a few points for you, really. Well, yeah. And so that's why I I was only there. I mean, your regular tour it was at least a year in in other units, but it right. was the armored because they always were pulled into reserve and stuff. Well, they always have reserve units and infantry mm -hmm. things. So. Um, Did you get any liberty at all while you were in Korea? Like. No. The only offer I had was that R and R, but they come up with that about two weeks before I was going to go home, and I said, I, I'm, I don't know. I'm going to get out of here as quick as I can. Yeah. Well, I said, I oh, know I'll be getting my R and R in about two weeks. I'm, well, with a tank, you could only one guy could, you know, go at a time. Oh, um, I see. Yeah. I mean, there's five guys, but they yeah, at least had to have four guys to run it. They didn't. So everything, USO shows or something, one guy. Yeah. Did you ever get to attend a USO show? USO show. Yes, and we we drew straws, and I got the straw. God, that that was the worst thing I ever did. Was that? <laughs> Well, the thing was about 50 miles away, and if, you know, those roads over there, it, it felt like you were, <laughs> took a beating. For were you in a Jeep when you went there? Or no, not? no, they had us in the back of a truck, you know, with the wooden <laughs> benches and bouncing for 50 miles. Each way. <laughs> yes. I would. What, uh, I said, what town was that in, do you recall? No, I have no idea, because that, that was early when I was there. I didn't even know where I was. So. Do you know who the entertainers were? Yes. She come out in a bathing suit. <laughs> and, and, and see, I know she didn't stay out long. Uh, I knew her name. See, I'm not... That's all right. I, I'm a... You've done remarkable. Was it was it Betty Hutton maybe? Was Betty uh, was Betty Grable? No, Betty Hutton. Uh, that that's possible. I don't know. I don't know. 
But it, it wasn't, it was the worst, <laughs> one of the worst days. Of, well, you know, they always told us that tanks were the smoothest riding vehicle in Korea, you know. So. And it was cold when she was performing. Yeah. Oh, was yeah, anybody yeah. else with her? Any other movie stars or anything? Well, they had some other people. I, but you're so far away. You're not close to them? No. 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 no we were. I don't know who gets close, but well, they, I say that was a bad day. Well, you guys were there. Did you uh, have any alcohol or any beverages or? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, people, I never found anybody that just believes us, but we'll, we'll, that was the one advantage to being with, the, with that first rock division. When, uh, every month they'd come out, we got a fifth of whiskey and a case of beer. Now, where that came from, I know that didn't come from the American. That how they got that I don't know, but but it really wasn't an advantage because finally I used to just hold the whiskey and give it to somebody from another unit and let them have the problem. <laughs> I, I, I'm well, now beer. I did uh, the only problem there was trying to keep it from freezing in winter and yeah. then in summer. Oh, there's a creek that runs through there, we'd dump it down in there, and that was our cooler, so. Yeah. But, uh, well, and then we used to, uh, you didn't want to leave it back there at the base camp because those guys, <laughs> there was never none left, so the guys start putting it in their bags and taking it up on a line till an officer was watching one day in a mortar took the bag and the beer cans flew all over and that was the end of taking any. Were they beer cans? Yes. Not bottles? No, beer cans, but they were looking for Second World War. They were rusty and everything. <laughs> but they came in, in spurlap bags and then they'd distribute them around. The, the, uh, the Koreans would? No, Americans no. Americans would? Well, I mean, they, we got them from the American now, oh, where okay. they got this. Oh, okay. But I think it was stuff left over from the Second World War, you know. But, uh, yeah, so that was the end of the taking any beer. Or that. How often did you get regular cook meals? The what? Regular cook meals. Like oh, in the, in, in the, well, that's what I said. We'd go, when, when we were with that rock, we just went online and that was no meals, cook meals. Now, when we went with the 7th Infantry, later on, we'd have one hot meal a day. They would bring that up to us, too. But that's the only... So if I understand it right, when you're on the line and you go to, to for the to sleep at night, yeah. you leave one man on guard at the tank and the other four are in a tent, not too far back. Yeah, well, a Is tent if we, if we were going to stay, now we slept on the ground most of the time. That's I mean, because question. you're moving too much, you know. Okay. So, uh, and you're able to keep reasonably warm. I don't know how to describe it because the winters over there I hear are horrendous. Well, you learn little tricks. We start dig, digging a, a, like a trench out and pile the snow up to keep the wind, you know. Mm -hmm. And then take your boots off and flop down in there with everything at 45, everything on your side, and into the sleeping bag, and you sleep. I mean, uh, you know, you don't have no regular sleeping hours, so you did it. Uh, you, uh, but no, I. Was, my favorite place was under the tank. For some reason, nobody else wanted to be there. Inside the tank, a little guy could curl up in the turret floor, 
but in the driver, I don't know, they usually sat in their seat and slept. Mm. <laughs> but I, I like to lay and get down, and they thought I was crazy, but I, I was always sleeping under the thing. I, so nobody ever started the tank on me, so that, which they wouldn't unless I. <laughs> well, you're the tank commander. Anyway, yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, so you come home on November. I guess you're shipped out to come home on November the 29th of 52. Well, earlier than that, sometime mm -hmm. maybe late November or something when we left. That was 15 days, you know, on the water. Where did you leave from in Korea? What city do you recall? We got down to Pusan again across the Sasebo. Yeah. Then from Sasebo? From there we shipped a, to uh, on the Marine Serpent we came from. From there we went home. We didn't go back to Yokohama. Uh, and where did you land at in the United States? Then? San Francisco. San Francisco. Yes. I see. What type of a ship did you come back on? Well, they were all those World War II cargo or merchant ships or whatever they call them. I don't know. They, they were all made in the troop carriers. So they, there was another couple thousand of us on yeah. that one. You came back by yourself, nobody from your outfit with you? No. No, wait, no, that, that same guy that I knew from uh, Price Hill, he was on the same one coming Don back. Miller, wasn't it? Yeah, Don Miller. He, he was on the same yes, troop uh, ship with you then, huh? Yes. But that's the only guy. So I you, you're in San Francisco then, is that what you said? Yes. And uh, where do you go from there? Well, we got, they, depending on where you're going, we got on another troop train back to, uh, well, they, they took us to Fort Benjamin Harrison in, in Indiana. Right. Or the Indianapolis. Somehow camp, we got camp, them. Was it Camp Atterbury or Benjamin Harrison? At, Atterbury, that's it. That's yeah. it. Not Benjamin Harrison. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's that, where they. And is that where you were discharged? That's where they discharged. Well, we went home and then had to go back to Atterbury. And, and then they give us a choice. You know, our, our time wasn't up, but you could either stay or they would discharge you early, which I didn't see no reason to stay. They didn't use me up. So, so I got a three months ahead of my. Right. You know, so so you, you came right back to Cincinnati? Yes. And uh, what did you do when you got home? What do you mean, what I did when? Oh. <laughs> when you got home, you're discharged. Oh, well, I took a month or so off, and then my job was there with, you know, back to plumber apprentice, and back to school, and then just... What was the company you worked for as a plumber? Well, there was a Hill and Brand Plumbing Company that... Uh, that's where I stayed till I got out of my. So, you, you're discharged and you're back at your job uh, with the plumbing company, and you're also going to do the apprentice school. Yes. Um, and your mom and dad are at home, and yes. you uh, have you. Uh, is there any romance in your life yet? Or? Well, <laughs> yes, yes, I. Uh, when I got discharged, and then, well, that was, well, late November, because... November 29th, yes. Yeah. You know, and then, uh, getting well, close to Christmas, so a couple of the guys that I hung around with, they, they were home, they were still in the service, they came for Christmas, so... Instead of sitting in a bar, we said, let's go down to Topper Club down there. You down know, at the music hall? Yes. On the second yeah. floor? Yes. <laughs> and the guy I was with, a friend of mine, he was home for Christmas. And he run into this girl that he had dated in, in high school. And 
he got talking to her and she said, oh, come on over to our table. And there was a little Italian girl sitting there. <laughs> so she introduced us and that's when it all started. <laughs> and what was that little Italian girl's name? Rose Benavengo. Yes. And um, so you met Rose at the uh, Top. Topper Club. Yes. Down on Elm Street. Yes. Uh, and uh, how long did you go with Rose before you guys got engaged or married? About two years. Two years. Yeah. I, I wasn't in a hurry. <laughs> well, she was four years younger than me, too. Was she still in school whenever you No. Were, no she would no. already graduated from high school. Yeah, she was working. Where did she work at? Gibson greeting card. Sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. So. So, um, did you um, continue working at the plumbing company? Did you change jobs or what happened? Well, I worked for Hill and Brand for 13 years and then I went with T.J. Dyer, which is a big, that was the one my father worked with all his life. And so then, from then on, Hill and Brand was kind of the guy who was retiring that run it. And so, I went to work for T.J. Dyer got to work on all these big buildings down here. <laughs> the one on Fountain Square, we, I worked on that one. And the Netherlands players are there. I, my dad worked on it when they built it. and I worked on it when they remodeled the whole thing. So. And you were uh, technically uh, your job classification is plumber, master plumber. Or well, plumber, and then I, but I was the foreman or superintendent, whatever you want to call uh -huh. it, on plumbing. I, uh, Any new high rises in Cincinnati that you worked on? Well, I mean, there's a couple of more. I say that. Well, now it's a fifth, third building. It was Du Bois Tower on, and then we worked right around the corner. They called it the Formica building. I don't know what they call it now. It's, it's around on 4th Street, the front of it. Uh, yeah, we had worked all over the. And did you do that until you retired? Yes. Yes. And uh, what year did you retire, do you recall? Uh, 1992. Wow. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, well, let's go back to Rose. Um, Rose is working at Gibson Greeting Cards, yes. and uh, you going together for two years. Yes. Did you finally decide to get married, or did she decide it for you? Well, <laughs> let's say it's a combination of both. I see. And uh, when did you get married? 1955. And the, the date? May 22nd, good, 1955. Good thing you remembered that. <laughs> yes. And where'd you get married at? What church? Well, there was a little Italian church up in Walnut Hills, Our Lady of Mount Carmel. It's gone now, but uh, well, and her house is right I-71, they took her home, you know, that she lived, grew up in there. Um, tell me about Rose's family, uh, her mom and dad. Well, well, they were immigrants from Italy. Her father was a, uh, an orphan. He, as far as he knows, he was picked up on a church steps out of, in a box. Uh, of course, you know, this is way back. <laughs> right. And no, he grew up and then, but as he got older, he, he, he got away from the family, whoever, who raised him, you what know. Town, what town was he raised in, do you recall? Do you remember saying oh. to you? <laughs> well, they lived in a, a town called Rockabella. It is in the mountains, in, in kind of central it, Italy there. That's where they, but then her, her father, I, well, he told a lot of stories. He, he, he kind of 
took a work on, on ships, you know, going on the Mediterranean as a cabin boy when he was young, he says, so I don't know. And uh, then they, they got married and they had two children and then he decided to, or they decided they would, you know. What were their and, names? Well, John, John and Jeanette Benavengo. Okay, uh, and so he's married and got two kids? Yes. And he decides to come to America? Well, yes, so they worked it out. He would come over and get a job and get established. But see, they knew people, oh, like that Walnut Hills that where yeah. they lived. That was all Little Italy up uh, there. Up there on Boone Street. Now. Yeah, yeah. But you got it, Boone yeah, Street. I remember that as a boy. Yeah, well, she lived on Wilkinson, which was right. Mm -hmm. um, so he came over first. Did he come through Ellis Island? No. <laughs> uh, Rose's sister was doing she found where her mother and her two brothers came through Ellis Island. And they used to always kid him. They says, what did you do, jump off of that ship before you come? And, no, 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 he come through, you know, he was a, well, when Rosie's sister Jean was down here look, looking for, there was a guy uh, there too, and he, and she started telling him the story. And he said, well, what year was that? I don't know, 1920-something. He says, you know, they took immigrants in through Boston in those years, just for one or two years, just they were having so many in Ellis Island that they, and she went and looked on Boston, and there was his name, John Padmingo. <laughs> so, <laughs> so she found him after all those years. He didn't know where he came, came in. But, uh, what did he do for a living? He worked for CG&E. All, all was yeah. his life, I guess. But again, they, they, had, they knew a lot of people, sure. you know, and that's how they got these jobs. Well, after you and uh, and your wife got married, where did you live? Well, we lived in Redding, Redding for one year, moved to St. Bernard for two years, and then they were building these houses out in White Oak. In uh, 1959, we moved up there. Wow. I've been there ever since. Yes. You know? At the same address. Yes. It's a wonderful neighborhood. It's still well, a great neighborhood. Yeah, it's still yeah. still holding up. Not yeah. as good as it used to be, but I mean. And how many children did you and Rose have? Five. And um, if you would, would you name your children? Uh, Mary Shawley, the oldest girl. Julie Schaefer, the middle girl. And Amy Helms is the youngest girl. And then two sons, Dan and Steve. And Steve. Yeah. You know, um, and uh, in our conversations before the interview started, you mentioned your brother uh, that was on the USS Franklin. Yes. That was an aircraft carrier. Yes. And. Uh, as you said, the Franklin lost more men than any ship in World War II, or, or any aircraft, any carrier. aircraft carrier, even the ones that sunk. Yes. Yeah. Uh, what was your brother's name? Al. Alfred Al Clingers. Um, yeah. And is he still with us, or did no? He no. was a naval seaman on board. Yes, he was on one of those on one of the gun crews. And how did they come to to? Um, it wasn't actually sunk, but they had the uh, they had the abandoned ship. Yes. How did that happen? Do you recall? Well, this plane come in and dropped two bombs. One hit among the park planes, which was all fueled up, and I mean they were ready for taking off the bomb Japan. They were only 50 miles off the coast of Japan with a battle group. Right. And uh, 
the first, you know, and then another bomb went down through the deck on forward part of it. Now where he was, was up on the forward part on the side with a gun mm -hmm. crew. And, uh, but it was all a, a surprise. They thought it was some of our own planes. The incoming planes that they saw, they thought was our own airplanes. Well, they, they thought that's what their Franklin kept saying, that they thought it was their uh, scout planes returning. But uh, other ships had actually warned them. Japanese bombers. Well, Japanese plane. I mean, I, I guess they were like dive bombers. Torpedo bombers. Or, well, you know. Or, 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 or bombers. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Dive bombers, whatever mm -hmm. they called them at that time. And two of them hit the Franklin. Yes. And yeah. uh, they lost a lot of men, I guess. Well, the gasoline and the bombs and just, and then it, it, it all that gasoline was just pouring down through the ship and naturally catching fire. And uh, no, they, like my brother said, just about everybody down below didn't get out of it, you know. Right. And uh, well, again, he, he's, he and some guys, wherever, were stuck up there on that. And, uh, but, well, there was no abandoned ship ever. You know, they were, never did tell them to abandon ship, and that's when they decided to do it on their own. Well, they said it when the fire was coming closer to them with the, all the gasoline along so they, with explosions and things. And yeah. so they decided, of course, like he said, when you come down off of that thing. You're a long ways up. The six story, you know, it's like a six story building yeah. jumping off. And he said some of them just didn't come up again, you know. Now he was always a good swimmer, so. Yeah. That's and how long was he underwater, would you say? No, 45 minutes. But it, oh. it was cold. It was winter time. They said an hour was about all that they would have lasted, you know. But these other ships start coming in, picking them up, so. Very fortunate. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So I thought we would mention that because uh, so many families had more than one member in the service, yes. you know, during those times. Well, my younger brother was in the Navy too, but that was after, you know, between Korea and uh, Vietnam. He, yeah. So I had two Navy and me. <laughs> yeah. Um, at this time, Don, I usually uh, interrupt and have Brian. Uh, Brian, do you have any questions you wanted to ask uh, Don? Yeah, I have a few questions. So, did, you had a brother who was in the Navy. I know you got drafted in the Army, but could you have gone in the Navy? Did you have any choice uh, as far as branch of service? No, actually, I had looked into going into the Navy and I think he had to sign up for four years at that time, and I got, that. I, I thought, no, I'll just take my chances. Well, my older brother, he, as soon as he got the day he got out of high school, which was 1944, he just went down because in those days, once you get out of high school, they drafted you. And uh, so he went and enlisted in the Navy. He said he wasn't going to be in no foxhole, but. Uh, it turned out he may have been better off in a foxhole than where he, well, but he got off in days. Well, one of the questions we like to ask uh, veterans is, do you remember what you were doing when you heard about Pearl Harbor being attacked? Well, I know what I was doing. I was, uh, no, just playing around outside, and I saw my mother and them all, you know upset and that, knowing that, you know, that, uh, plus I think, didn't they start um, drafting even before Pearl yeah. Harbor, yes. And my dad, he missed the First World War. He was just a year younger, but then he got a draft 
not a, a note, a, but a, a draft, whatever you call it, a, a notice that he could be drafted. But at this time, he had five five of us kids, yeah. so he he didn't think he you know he was in the age group, right. but, uh, which was at that time I think forty four or something. Forties, yeah, yeah. But uh, well, when you got drafted into the army, did you uh, uh, had an idea of maybe what you wanted to do when you, you know if you had a choice while you're in the army? Not, not really. That's uh, kind of, kind of at their mercy, whatever they, they accept, did for you. You know. Well, how did you feel about being assigned to a tank division? Well, again, I had no preference, and well, I didn't really. I, you know, I didn't know nothing about no tank. I mean, I, no. If I had knew what we were going to end up, I would have paid more attention when we were training them. <laughs> of course, those were old M4 tanks. They were nothing like, you know, we had over there. Uh, I think when you went, you went in in '51. Yes. Was it, wasn't that around the time when uh, Truman uh, fired MacArthur? Well, yeah, that was right before, well before we got over there. Was that still talked about, or uh, when you were there? Well, did you talk about. Well, the yeah. I, or yeah. I mean, well, yeah, everybody was talking about that. That, I mean, how could you fire a guy like that? You know that uh, just, but that's. Of course, he was getting too. I mean, he was doing some dumb things too. I mean, uh, well, a lot of that stuff that he, it didn't really pan out what he wanted to do. Well, for one thing, he wanted to go right through China and all up there. Yeah. I mean, so. Um, but, yeah. Um, well, what were your uh, impressions of? Korea. Obviously, you got there on a very cold day, but I mean, what, what did you think of Korea as a country or as a, as a... Well, it was like you were stepping back into the Stone Age. I mean, uh, well, you just couldn't believe that there were still people living like this, you know. they. Uh, did, did you eat any uh, Korean food? No, not while we were over there no opportunity to, or uh, now since I've, uh, with that Dr. Lee I was telling you about, we, yeah. I've gone out to lunch now with him. It, it's, uh, and we go, those Korean church, now see those people appreciate what, what we did. And, uh, th well, it's just different with, with those people. than I think, you know, other wars, you know, like the French and all them, I don't think they ever appreciated the people like these Koreans do. I mean, they they invite us to all those Korean churches and dinners and lunches and and when we when we were over there, I mean, you just everybody, you know, they just couldn't thank you enough for right. and uh, you know and act like you were some. We're really something. <laughs> we were. <laughs> well, you are. Well, you did. You did what you were called upon to do. Yes, but but uh, one, <clears throat> just one story about when we were over there. Uh, they took us into Seoul, and there was a shopping district there. I don't know if you ever heard of that, but um, there was another guy. He, we did well. His wife, he was a widower, and so was I. So we kind of hung around. He was from Wisconsin, but we were sitting on a bus, and I, as they said, we'd have a couple of hours there. And I, I said, hey, you just should we take a walk or do something? I don't want to sit on this bus. He said, well, I don't even want to go to the shop, and I. Anyway, this girl, one of the interpreters on the bus, she says, come on, I'll walk. She said, now if you want to buy something, I'll hassle with that. But anyway, we walked up the street and this, 
uh, I, there was an old lady standing in the, in the doorway of this store, you know, and she said something to this girl, and that girl said, hey, wait a minute. She, says, she went over and talked to her, and she come back, she says, that lady wants to know if you're uh, American soldiers that were over here during the war. And she said, I told him, yeah, that's, you know, that the church had brought us over there. And so she said, well, wait, that lady wants to talk to you. So she come over, well, she couldn't speak English, but she was telling the, you no, know, she come over to us and she started hugging me and this guy and holding our hands. And that girl says, she says, the American soldiers saved her whole family, you know. When the Chinese come in, uh, and the U.S. was going to move back. He said, they came through our neighborhood with trucks, you know, and said, anybody who wants to go back south to a safe place, get on the truck. Don't take nothing because we're just taking people. And she says, my father, he says, well, I don't want to just leave everything here. And he said, finally, he said, I think we maybe have to go. She said, they put us on a, she said, I was nine or 10 years old at the time, put us on a truck and the rest of the family. And, he, and she says, you saved our lives. Every, she's, you know, she's crying, <laughs> makes me cry. And, uh, sure. and uh, she, she said, cause those Chinese come through that neighborhood and you know, they're, she said, the relatives and they're all their friends. She said, they just shot them all down, she says. And she says, our whole family, she says, the American soldiers saved us all, so. And then she wanted to take us somewhere and buy something for us. We said, we don't, you know, we yeah. don't need nothing. But right. she, so, but she would not let us alone. She kept hugging us. So. That's a wonderful story. <laughs> Well, and this other guy, he says, I guess it was worth what we done. Well, he, he never did have full use. He, he was a paratrooper over there, but a machine gun bullets, he took three of them right up one arm, you know, mm -hmm. and his arm was, he said, maybe it was worth what we done. Yeah. So. Can you, why were you, what was this church group? Can you talk, I think before the interview, you talked a little bit about Korean gentleman that you... Oh. Can you talk well, a little bit about who he is and what that group is? Well, that's a Korean War Veterans Association, and the chapter 121. <laughs> but uh, this is Dr. Lee. He was actually a North Korean, but then he, he ended up be an interpreter volunteering with the U.S. Army throughout the whole war. Then his his family was part when, when during the um, when when they evacuated all of them out of Hung Nam up there. They took Korean civilians and all. Well, his family and then his wife's family. Well, he didn't know her at the time, but um, but they they were able to get out of North Korea, and uh, they took them all south to some island down there. He didn't know till after the war whether his family got out or not, but they did. So, but uh, then he well, I said. He, after the war, then he joined the North Korean Air Force, and then, by then, yeah, after he got out of medical school, so then he was a flight surgeon for them in 15 years before he retired. South, the South Korean Air Force. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and then he was flying, wounded in that, out of uh, Vietnam, and, that. and then he came over here, and up at Marietta, Ohio, at, there's a hospital up there. Some fella, he, he knew somehow from up in New York, and that's where he did the rest of it, you know. 
but he had to go to more medical school, you know, for to get his stuff for over here. But so he he was an anesthesiologist then for years up there at uh, Marietta, and then his children had come to school here at UC and. So he moved down here to Cincinnati, and then he heard about the Korean War veterans. And, well, he's he's kind of a a member. Uh, well, he is a member, but yeah. uh, I mean they kind of adopted him. <laughs> well, he's he's got more more time in combat than, than than the soldiers did, but he was just an interpreter. Mm -hmm. But he spoke four languages, so. And they needed people who could talk Chinese and that, like he could. So. And no, oh, and he's just the same as the rest of the Korean people. He can't do enough for you, you know. So, was it who who did you go over to Korea with when you when you were there? You were saying when you met oh. that woman shot. What was that trip about? Well, the Say Eden Presbyterian Church in Seoul, a big church. It's got the church is like one of these buildings here. Uh, but they, on the, on the 60th anniversary, they were going to have all you know invite veterans back, and then in a we went to all these government you know, big celebrations that they had. And between the two of them, uh, but we just f filled out, you know, applications and they, uh, I, I think what took mine when I said that we were with the First Rock Division a lot, all of a sudden the guy called me and said, you're, you're going over there. I said, well, Okay, so, but uh, that's what that was, but everything was covered. They, they sent plane tickets from Cincinnati to Chicago is where we had a meet. And then we flew from Chicago to, um, well, in, Incheon now is it's, it's, um, the air, the air, their main airport now. But they, they took us everywhere. We were up at the DMZ, and of course, now even then they put rock troops on the bus with you when you, you, know, when you go up there. Well, and as yeah. North Korean, they come around the building and stand right on the line. Don't none of these people come over and yeah. step on that line. I'm, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, uh, scary people. Have you done honor fight? Yes. Yeah. When did you do that? In nineteen, uh, no, twenty thirteen. <laughs> yes, yeah, four years ago. So. Yes. Yeah, that was quite an experience too. I mean that. Uh, did you have a lot of Korean Wars in, uh, veterans in your group that went to D.C.? Well, we went four years ago. There was about half and half of, of Korean veterans and uh, World War II veterans. But had there's you, a lot. Had you been to D.C.? Had you seen the, the Korean War monument before? That well, yes. One. Uh, right after that was built, my wife and I, and we took a couple of grandchildren with us and went up and saw it. And so I had actually, but that was before the World War II that was, uh, so, I, yeah, I had seen it, but, uh, uh, and we were there the right time on the honor flight, the Korean, that was, they were, celebrating something. I can't think of what they, but they had a big thing and we were talking to those people. Um, well, that's my last question. Well, we've, uh, oh.
reached the end of our interview, Don, and, and well, at this point I want to well, thank you for the interview, and I also want to particularly thank you for your service to our country. And thank you so much. Welcome.